Hi everybody. I'm here today to talk to you about Money Matters. So a little bit about me. My name is Leanne Denja. Um, I have been at Eastern. This is actually my 28th year. Um, I got my undergraduate degree here and my graduate degree here. And then I actually turned down a full ride to PhD school somewhere else because I got a job offer at Eastern and I loved it so much I knew it was where I wanted to stay. Um, so I've been teaching and working since then and the last 13 years um, I have been in the Office of Financial Aid. So I'm here today to talk to you about my office and what we do as well as student business services um, or the billing office, some universities call it the bursar's office, um, and what they do. So today we're going to cover a few things. We're going to talk about um, applying for federal student aid, the FAFSA, um, and understanding your award letter or aid offer, um, calculating costs. Um, so these two points here, um, I would say if you have your award letter um, or aid offer that came in the mail, um, if you could go ahead and pause this and get that out. Um, and then the calculating costs is a worksheet that's in um, the Fast Track Student Workbook. Um, so it's like one of the first pages um, called Financial Planning. Um, and so if they've sent that to you as a PDF or if that's something that you have in physical form, if you want to go ahead and have that out too, um, it'll be really helpful. So you can pause this and get those things out so you have them um, for the presentation. Um, we'll talk about understanding the bill and what that looks like. Um, same thing if you want to have your laptop open so you can kind of log in. Um, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, and then Eagle One card and some next steps. So kind of all of the things you want to make sure that you've checked off on your list um, before fall semester gets here. All right, so how do I get started with the financial aid process? Um, I would anticipate that many of you have already done this, um, and each year you do that by completing the FAFSA, or the Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Um, so it is something that you will have to do every year. Um, you submit it annually. Um, every year it becomes available October 1st, um, and you would have used 2018 tax information for this upcoming 2021 school year. Um, you can fill it out on a desk desktop computer, um, or actually what I would even recommend is this really handy dandy My Student Aid app. Um, the first year it was a little wonky. This will be the third year that it's been out. And this past year I used it um, to fill out my daughter's FAFSAs. Um, and I found it a really helpful tool, especially when you're not both in the same place at the same time, which is why, where you might be, you know, come next year, sophomore year when you're filling out, um, sorry, you're filling out, you know, for aid for your sophomore year in October, um, and you might not be in the same place at the same time, the app allows you to kind of student do their thing on their own phone, and then a parent can do their part on their phone, and because it's using the same information of the student, they match up together um, to submit the FAFSA, and that can be really helpful for folks when they're not at the same place at the same time. Um, so you'll do that every year, um, and that's how you'll apply for federal financial aid, which is things like the Pell Grant, um, but also other things like federal work study um, and student loans or even um, a parent loan, um, that's all federal aid. So I finished the FAFSA now, what? I just wanna pause here a moment to say, of course students are not required to file the FAFSA. Um, in financial aid, we're always gonna recommend that everyone do it, um, but it is possible to have aid without filing the FAFSA. Um, you might've been offered an Emerald Scholarship, your family might say, well, we're not gonna qualify for any grants and, you know, or maybe, you know, work study, and so what's the point? We don't want loans. Um, you don't have to file the FAFSA um, to receive financial aid. You can still get a scholarship without it, um, but again, we recommend that everyone fill it out. And assuming you did, um, you only needed two things to get an award, um, an, sorry, an aid offer or award letter in the mail, and that is to have filed your FAFSA and um, been admitted to Eastern. So we started sending these out a little bit after Christmas, just before the new year. Um, and this is when you open it up, 
um, what is on the left hand side is this checklist. Um, so this is a really helpful checklist if this is all new to you. Um, I would say about 75% of the questions that I get from new students and new families about what do we need to do next, are we doing everything we need to do, um, are really answered by just like following the the checks on this checklist. So if you've managed to hold on to that award letter, um, I would encourage you to keep it and use it as a reference point to check off all of the things to make sure that you're doing what needs to be done. If you have misplaced it um, or you didn't get one or don't remember receiving something that looked like this, this is fine. It's all available to students all the time through their My Emish account. So that account that they log into with their net ID um, and their password, um, they use that to navigate um, to financial aid and they can use that to determine um, if they have requirements and in a lot of cases follow links directly to those requirements. Um, so really helpful checklist if you've managed to hang on to it. I encourage you to make sure you've sort of done everything. Um, so even if it doesn't apply to you, you know, that you know, you've talked to your family or who's ever helping you on this journey about the student loans. Um, and certainly if you are taking them that you've, you know, completed all those items on the checklist that you've done the MPN, that you've completed the online entrance counseling um, and taking care of that. So on the other side of the award letter, when you open it up, um, is some information here um, about what it costs and what type of aid you do have available to you at EMU. So the first part of the award letter you'll notice is this estimate for tuition and fees in room and board. And then we show you information on any gift aid, any grants or scholarships, things that you don't need to pay back um, that you might have. And then we do the math for you and give you an information on, you know, what might be your estimated remaining balance after all of your gift aid has applied. And then show you options for what we call self-help financial aid. So things like loans um, or work study. So there's a few things I want to point out here. One is that you'll notice that this is an estimate. So it's based on 13 credit hours. That's what an average EMU student takes. You only need 12 credit hours to be considered a full-time student. Um, you might notice that your award letter or aid offer says 15 credit hours. And that would be if you have an EFOS, an Education First Opportunity Scholarship. Um, that's an award that does require 15 credit hours to maintain that scholarship. So we would have provided you that information. Um, if you're gonna be commuting, you can just take out this whole room and meal plan. Um, it, you know, you just pay attention to the tuition part. Um, and so I like to just kind of point that out. The other thing I want to talk about for just a moment is work study. So this is where you would know if you qualify for work study. And again, if you have misplaced your award letter, all of this information is available to students in their My Emish account. So you would be able to see it there. It will look a little bit different, but you'd be able to see if you have a scholarship, which one it is, if you know what your loan offers look like, and if you have work study. Work study is offered, so it is something you'll have to take action on and go into your account and accept. Um, and if you don't see work study here on this letter or in your EMU account, if you've misplaced this letter, that would mean that you don't qualify for federal work study this first year, 2021, your freshman year. Um, however, that does not mean that you can't work on campus. You absolutely 100% can work on campus without a federal work study award. Okay, so the biggest employers of students on campus are probably dining, housing, the student center, um, other departments like admissions, public safety, REC IM, by and large, those departments are not going to require that students have federal work study. Um, and so you'll be able to work on campus just fine without a federal work study award. What it means if you have it, if you see this as part of your award, is that you have a more options. So smaller departments, maybe the Department of Economics, um, the math department, 
the Office of Financial Aid, the Office of Records and Registration. If you wanted to work in those places, um, you would most likely have to have a federal work study award um, because we can't afford to hire you out of our budgets. Um, and so we rely on students who have federal work study since their paychecks are primarily funded by federal dollars. Um, and so you earn money the same as any student in the form of a biweekly paycheck. This does not pay to your student account. This is something that you earn by working over the course of the semester semester. Um, but you do have those options. So I would encourage you if you see federal work study, um, maybe make a point to contact offices that you might like to work with um, over the summer and ask them um, if they're hiring, tell them you're a freshman with federal work study and you're interested in applying. Um, you can also look for jobs um, by following this link. Um, and there's usually also a job fair as part of the orientation um, weekend at school, assuming, um, you know, we, we're still, we're, we're ready to be face to face at that point. Um, so there's lots of opportunities and that would be for both federal work study and re what we call regular student employment on campus. So will financial aid cover everything? To my mind, this is probably what most people come into a presentation like this wanting to know and figure out. And of course, the answer is it depends. Um, typically, when I'm giving this presentation you know, to a group, it's between 200 and 600 people. Um, they're all individuals. They all have different backgrounds, different socioeconomic statuses, different GPAs, different test scores. And so their financial aid is all over the board. Um, and so they're really isn't one answer that I can give you, but you can find out this answer for yourself. So in that packet for Fast Track, um, when you open it up, this financial planning guide is one of the first pages in that packet. Um, and this is a way for you to determine the answer to that question for yourself. So the first thing that you'll notice here is that there's this box for credit hours, and then it says times 453 per credit hour. This at this point is still an estimate. Um, we don't know exactly what tuition and fees will be in 2021. We won't know till June when the Board of Regents meets, um, but this is a very good estimate. We're good estimators in financial aid. Um, and what you wanna know at Eastern is we don't have block tuition, so at some school Schools, you can take between 12 and 18 credit hours and it just costs one flat amount. Um, at Eastern, we really allow you the opportunity to control your costs. So if you only want to take four classes, just be 12 credit hours, just make that full-time threshold, you're not going to have to pay as much as somebody um, who's maybe more interested in taking five or six classes or being in 16 or 18 credit hours, um, that will cost more. So we do charge by the credit hour and once you register, you'll know what that amount is so you'll be able to do this math and get a very good idea of what to expect for your estimated tuition um, and fee charges. Um, room and board, that is a set amount. So you'll notice it's a little different than what's on that aid offer letter. And that is because we know this amount for sure now. So that on the award letter was an estimate and this is now actual cost for an anytime meal plan and a double occupancy um, residence hall room which is what most freshmen um, choose. So those are the actual costs. And then every semester you register, there is a registration fee. Um, and then for your fall semester, first bill only, you'll see this somewhere in the neighborhood of $300 in fees for new student um, and orientation. And that's the cost of setting up your account at Eastern, you know, and God willing, you know, those first three days that you'll spend on campus as part of orientation where your meals are provided to you. Um, and so that is just a one time, one semester charge that you'll see on your fall bill only. Um, so you can add that all up and then put that total in the A box here. And then you can go down here with your aid offer or award letter and start to put in the things that you might have if you have Pell Grant, if you have Emerald Scholarship. If you have EFOS, you would just put that where this Emerald Scholarship is. Because um, if you have EFOS, um, that, that would override your Emerald Scholarship. It replaces your Emerald Scholarship. You wouldn't get both. Um, so you can put that in. Um, there's this information on loans, so subsidized and unsubsidized. If you're going to be accepting those, you can put those in. And you put in half for fall and half for winter when you're looking at amounts. Um, you'll notice there are these boxes for other. Maybe you have a residence hall award. Maybe you have an outside scholarship. Um, so maybe you competed for a scholarship online or you got something through your school or a community organization or your parents' work, and they're going to be sending you, let's say, for an example, a $1,000 check. Um, so what you want to know about outside scholarships is that 
one, if we get a thousand dollar check for you from some outside organization, we're going to put half of it for fall 500. And then we're going to put the other 500 on for winter because we're going to be billing you separately for the two semesters, but chances are they're probably providing a check for the whole year. Now that said, if you wanted that whole amount for fall, if you were counting on that for fall um, and the organization doesn't put any limitations on the funding, um, all you have to do is call us, email us, reach out to us and say, I would like that whole amount in fall and we can make that move for you. Um, or if for some reason you wanted to put it on hold for winter, same thing, we can make that move of funding for you. The other thing to know about outside scholarships is that by and large, with very, very, very few exceptions, anything you get from outside EMU just adds on to any scholarship that we have offered you. So it is very, very rarely that we would have to adjust any Emerald or EFOS um, type scholarship in order for, to fit in scholarships from an outside organization. There's a few exceptions, but they're so rare um, that you can just kind of count on that, I would say, in most cases, almost all cases, as extra money. So you add up all of that A that you have, you put that in C, and then you transfer the A and C down here to do the math and see if you have a remaining balance or if your financial aid will cover everything. If this amount is zero or it's negative, well then congratulations, everything is covered. Um, and we'll talk about what a negative balance means when we look at the e-bill. Um, if it's positive, then that's what you still owe. So after all your financial aid pays, the answer was no, it didn't cover everything. Thing. And so what are your options then? And so I want to talk to you about that. Um, so if you have a remaining balance, what are the different ways that you could potentially pay that? One of them you'll notice was on your aid offer or award letter in many cases, and that was a parent plus loan offer. So plus just stands for parent loan for undergraduate students. Um, that is a loan that's an option. It's something that your parent has the option of applying for. Um, it's not a requirement. Um, it does require that your parent go through a credit check. So unlike student loans, which are backed by the federal government, and even though as a student you'll have to do entrance counseling and a master promissory note, they're not checking your credit to give you that loan. Um, they limit the funds, so a student can only receive up to $5,500 as a dependent freshman in loans. Um, a parent loan is just limited by the budget. Um, and how that works is basically any parent can apply. So biological adopted step parent, but only a parent can apply. So this wouldn't apply to guardians or grandparents or aunts or anybody like that. So any parent can apply biological adopted or step parent and they apply for the loan. If they are approved, then they're taking out that loan for you. It pays to your student account. And then they have the option if they take out more than enough to pay off your remaining balance, if they want that sent to them as a check or if they want that to go to you as the student as a refund for you to use. Um, so if a parent is approved, um, that's how that loan would work. Now it is possible for a parent to get denied. So basically um, the federal government makes this decision, not the school. Um, if you have good credit, you will most likely be approved. If you have bad credit, you will most likely not be approved. So um, in cases where a parent doesn't have good credit and they apply for that, parent loan, but they are unable to take it out because um, they're not approved. In those cases only, we can offer the student then some additional unsubsidized or student loan funds. So only when a parent tries to take out the parent loan and doesn't get approved, gets denied, can we make that offer. But it's an additional 4,000 for the year or up to 4,000 for the year, 2,000 fall, 2,000 winter, um, that a student could borrow in some unsubsidized loan or student loan um, in addition to what they've already been offered. Um, to help them pay off that remaining balance. Um, but again, that's only when a parent applies for a parent loan and is not approved. Um, so sometimes, um, you know, students might have a situation where one parent does have good credit, one doesn't, um, and they'll make that decision, you know, together about what makes more sense. Does it make more sense for to have the parent that won't get approved take, you know, do the loan application so I can get more student loan? Or is it better to have more money um, and have the parent who we know will get approved take out the loan? Um, I have good credit. I know I would be approved. I have two kids I, in college right now. So I actually have eight children. 
Um, and when I do this presentation live, I often ask, do you think that I'm taking out a parent loan for them? And people sometimes say yes. And I'm like, are you crazy? What if I only did two years of loans for each of these kids? That's 16 years of parent loans. No, absolutely not. That's a bad fiscal decision. And some of you are thinking that the eight kids was a bad fiscal decision, but that's okay. Um, what I would have done is this second option listed here, this alternative private student loan. Um, this is a loan um, that a student can apply for. They can go through any, any financial institution that offers private student loans. Um, and the student applies um, and most it probably almost positively will need a co-signer. Um, so they can get a co-signer that could be a parent. Um, in my daughter's case, I would have co-signed on a private student loan for them, um, but it could be someone else. It could be a friend of another family member. Um, again, a guardian could uh, co-sign on a private student loan and um, with their good credit, um, you know, help that student to get that loan. But some for some folks, that makes more sense. It's a loan in the student's name, even though you're on the hook for it as a co-signer, it's their debt to pay off um, when school is said and done. Um, also, you might be able to get a better interest rate if you have good credit on a private student loan. The PLUS has a fixed interest rate set by the federal government, and a private student loan product might offer a lower interest rate if you have really good credit, and that might make more sense for a family. So again, that's, that's a conversation to have with the folks that might be helping you. Um, on this journey. Um, the other things are how you can just make payments towards the bill. So the bills will be sent out in July, um, but they won't be due until September 10th, 2020. Um, so say you're a student who has an EFOS um, and you're a commuter, and so the EFOS and the PAL are paying for your tuition um, and together, and then the only thing you might have to pay for is some fees. So that new student fee, orientation fee, your, your balance student Eastern might be somewhere in the neighborhood of $350, $400. I mean, maybe that's something that you've saved up and you'd have ability to just make a payment in September and pay that off. Um, the other option that you have is when you get that bill in July, you can enter into, at that point only, a fee-free five payment plan. So you make a 20% 20 20 payment, so a one-fifth payment of that bill. And then say your bill is $5,000, you pay $1,000 in July, and then you make the rest of the payments in August, September, October, November, and there's no charge for that. Um, maybe you get that bill in July and it's $5,000 that you owe and you don't have $1,000. Or you were thinking that you weren't going to do student loans, but now looking at things you might. Maybe you're waiting for an outside scholarship, that check that hasn't come in, because those don't typically come in that early. They're usually coming in in August. And so you want to wait. So you can still sign up for a payment plan come August. That this point, you'll be paying a fee for that. In the past, it's been $35, so it, we would anticipate it would be around that much. Um, and you pay that one time, one semester fee, and then it splits that bill into four payments. So you're making 25% payment. And then the same thing is true, say you wait until September. So maybe you're that student that I gave as an example who has a, uh, you know, maybe a $400 bill um, and you could pay $35 to do the payment plan and break that up into three payments, September, October, November. Um, when you go through the e-bill system, and we'll show you what this looks like in a couple of slides, you have the option to opt in for automatic or scheduled payments too. So if you know you're always going to use the same routing and account number and you keep track of your bills, um, you could just do an opt-in for automatic scheduled payments so you don't have to think about making those payments. Um, but that is an opt-in thing. It won't automatically happen. So if you don't select that option, you want to make sure that you're keeping in mind what those due dates are and you're making those payments as you need need to. Um, so that's important. Uh, so that's a little bit about the different payment plan options you would have at this ebill.umich.edu. Um, and so that's our bill. Um, and this is what it looks like, the system looks like when you're logging in. So um, it's ebill.umich.edu. Anyone can get to that site and you'll see there's two types of logins you can make here. So students, you will have your university ID number and PIN number that you'll use. So that's your E number and then a six digit PIN number that you can find by logging into your My eMich account. Um, that is your login. That isn't something to give to your mom, to give to your dad, to give to you know your guardian, grandparent, whoever's helping you pay the bill and say, okay, log in with my stuff and pay my bill. Um, at this point, I usually ask 
um, how many students are paying their own bills. Um, and usually in a room of two to 600 people, I'll maybe have at most a dozen uh, students raise their hand. Um, and so to everyone else, I say welcome to your first bill. Um, so one thing is you can set up a parent, a guardian, someone else as an authorized user and then they'll have their own login to make payments um, or help manage your bill. So that would be the appropriate thing to do. So when you open up the bill, this is what it's gonna look like. And you'll see that this arrow over here is showing authorized users. So you can go into this email system now, and I encourage you to do so right now. This is gonna show zero dollars because you don't know anything right now. And you can set up whoever you want to as an authorized user. They'll get their own login. Um, they'll put in their email. They'll get notifications when your bills are due. I get this for my daughter who's at Eastern, so I get a notification. Even if her bill is zero dollars, sometimes I get a notification. Um, and so I can able to kind of keep a pulse on that with her um, that way. This is also, you can see where you might sign up for a payment plan. There's one here, you can sign up up here. Uh, but this is like the meat and potatoes of the bill, right? So students, I said, if this is your first bill, this balance due, if you're living on campus and taking four or five classes, this is gonna be about a little upwards of $11,000. Mm -hmm. So congratulations on your first bill, because um, this is your bill. It's not your parents' bill. It's your education. It's your bill for it. And so if you have a parent or a guardian or a family member or somebody who is helping you pay this bill, um, I would like you to express some love to them. That could be a note. That could be a hug. That could be a fist bump, um, elbow bump in this time of COVID. But do something to show your appreciation to these folks who are helping you pay this enormous first bill. Um, because even, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're not living on campus um, and you're just enrolling full time, again, you're looking at a $5,000 bill. Um, and then the next thing you would see is any estimated financial aid. So the only thing that's gonna show up here is aid that is ready to pay. Um, and so if you're planning on taking out loans but you haven't completed requirements, that's not gonna show up. Um, if you haven't submitted your final high school transcript, I'll talk about that in a couple more slides. Nothing's going to show up here. So only what is ready to pay is going to show up here. And then we'll provide you information on what your balance is after your financial aid applies. So then that's what, if you were doing a payment plan and say, you know, you wanted to do, it was three payments option at this point, that would be your $1,000 payments, you know, add in that fee and it's, you know, $1,010 or whatever. Um, so this gives you that information. This allows you the ability to sign up for a payment plan or, you know, hit this big green make a payment button and, and make a payment towards that bill. Um, you can, um, you know, there's a couple other things that you can do here, but I think that's really the stuff that we, that we wanted to point out for you. And then you can hit this view and view a, a statement, but what you want to keep in mind about your statement is it's going to be a static activity. Those are gener generated like once a week. And so anything that has happened since then is not going to show up. It's, it's not um, a, an active thing. That's where you could go to view activity to see um, like what things are looking like now. So students, right now, go ahead, log in when you can, set up these authorized users, look at your nice $0 balance. Um, don't feel like you have to wait um, to check that system out. So getting towards the end here, what do I need to know about the Eagle One card? The Eagle One card is going to be your university ID card. Um, I am not 100% sure how this is going to be rolled out to you folks that won't be coming to campus, um, but I'm sure they'll be very communicative with you about what you'll be doing. Um, normally, if you were coming to campus for a regular fast track, the first part of the day would be getting your picture taken for this ID card and then it comes to you in a about four weeks. Um, so we'll see what that's going to look like, but it's going, it, at some point, you're going to get information and you're going to figure out how it's going to come to you. And it's important that you know that even though it has this MasterCard logo, it is not a credit card. It can never be a credit card. It will never be a credit card. Um, Hopefully that's clear. This is not a credit card. It's your university ID card and it's how you're gonna access all your student privileges. So it's gonna be how you get into the rec, how you check a book out of the library, how you get into your residence hall room, how you utilize your meal plan, um, all of those things. Um, so the other thing that will happen is when it comes, it's gonna come from South Dakota in this green envelope. 
and about four weeks from the point where they tell you, you know, what to do to get it ready to go. And you will go online to activate it. And when you go online to activate it, part of that process is setting up this refund or payroll preference. And so if you go to your email and you have a negative amount here in this balance, so your aid is more than your balance and there's a negative amount, that is what would be refunding to you. That would be a credit balance. And so you'd be telling us how you wanna receive that when you're activating this card as a freshman first year. So you'll have two options. You'll have the option to sign up with Bank Mobile. If you look at this card, you can see there's a little Bank Mobile up here. That is the online bank that's affiliated with the Eagle One card. You can open up an account with them. And then that is why this has a MasterCard logo, because then this would now become a debit card for that account. A debit card again not a credit card it's only going to be able you're only gonna be able to make a point of sale purchase at the grocery store or at Amazon or whatever if you have money in this account um, but that's one option that you have and then payroll is the same thing so if you work on campus whether that's regular student employment or work study this is where your paychecks are gonna go to this account or you have the option to use a bank account that already exists. You do not have to use Bank Mobile. And in fact, even though I've talked about it, I would advise against choosing Bank Mobile. So Bank Mobile is an outside vendor um, that we work with and are in a contract with, but we don't have agency over what they charge as fees, what their fee structure is. And recently they have implemented a fee structure that I would say most of us um, are not happy with. So you have to maintain a certain number of deposits and balance in order for that account to remain fee free. And it's just really not an ideal setup. So I have told my own daughter, I would advise other students, don't sign up for Bank Mobile. Use an account. If you've already got a bank account, just use that and set that up when you activate your card as your quote unquote refund payroll preference. When you get paychecks, they'll go into that account. Again, whether you're working work study or regular student employment on campus, and if you ever had a credit balance, that's where it would be sent to that outside bank account. Um, if you don't already have a bank and you're thinking that you don't wanna do bank mobile because I suggested against it, what I might suggest is that you look up the EMU credit union. Um, EMU has a credit union on campus. They're actually um, partnered with U of M credit union um, and they're a great, um, you know, very student friendly um, place where you could set up an account if you don't currently have a bank account and then just use that routing and account number that you you have for that that new credit union account as um, your refund pay for payroll preference when you activate this online. If you misplace instructions, just keep in mind that the 16 digits that are listed on the card is your number for an activation code should you need to activate your ID. Um, and then if you choose Bank Mobile, um, you'll just have to be careful because there's a campus access strip and then a debit strip that are different. Um, on the card, but assuming you don't use bank mobile, this is, you know, not this debit magnet strip is not going to be active anyway. So it'll kind of be a non issue. Um, so that's what you'll be looking for in terms of the Eagle One card. So last things to do to just kind of make sure that you're ready for fall semester. One of them, um, obviously it says submit your FERPA at the resource fair today, and that's probably not going to be likely for many of you. Um, but you can get a FERPA release form. Um, if that isn't something that's sent to you or linked on the orientation homepage, just go ahead and put in FERPA release. Um, and FERPA stands for Federal Education Rights and Privacy Act. Um, so it's a federal law. Um, and so essentially what it means is once you register, once you enroll in a class and become a registered student at an institution, we can no longer talk to anyone else about your account unless you have released us to do so. So this FERPA form, as we call it, allows you to release allows up you to tell us that it's okay to release information to other people. Um, so you can still get this. Um, again, 
if it's, it's not available as a link really easy in the orientation packet, then I would say just go ahead and look it up on the EMU website, put in FERPA release. It should be on records and registration forms directory page. And you can print this out and release, um, allow us to release information to up to two people per form. So if you have four people, you just get two forms. It's pretty easy. Um, but make sure you fill out the form completely. So the form has to be filled out completely. Um, so we need a four digit, um, it says the last four digits of their social security number, but it could be whatever four digits they want to use as a, a pin. It's how we'll verify their identity if they're on the phone. Um, the other thing is make sure you use an email that they would be emailing from. So if you want your mom to be able to ask questions or advocate for you, she needs to email from that email and we need to see that on the form in order for us to be able to communicate with her and verify that that's her and that she's been released um, by you for us to give information. So I know this is probably important for many of you. You have family members, friends, um, folks that are helping you on this journey that you want to be able to advocate for you. And so it's really Really important that as you get registered you get these forms submitted um, so if it doesn't say on the form um, you can look up the fax number for records and registration or you may email it to registrar which is r-e-g-i-s-t-r-a-r at emish.edu, so that's emich.edu, just like your own email address, and make sure that they have that on file um, and get it in the system for you. Um, again, if you've got that checklist, great. If not, go into that EMU account, your My Emish account, and look at your financial aid tab and your eligibility and see if you have any documents you need to send in, requirements that you need to complete. Even though the university is not open to take things in person, we are absolutely continuing to accept and review documents. So if we're asking for them, don't delay in getting them in. We are working um, and we wanna get that stuff so that you're good and you have everything ready to go. Um, June 1, is a good, good rule of thumb um, for getting everything submitted. If you're listening to this after June 1, that's fine. Don't panic, um, but get things in as soon as you can. Um, when you get that EMU Eagle One card, make sure you go online to activate it. And I didn't really stress this point before, but students, make sure you're doing this activation, okay? Uh, you're probably hopefully not as busy as you might normally be this time senior year, um, which I know is probably a bummer, but I mean, normally you've probably got, you know, whatever homework load, whatever extracurricular activities, um, you know, that you're all trying to manage and it can be overwhelming. I know I've, I've had two seniors already, um, but it's really important that you take agency and that you do this stuff that you don't let your mom or your dad or whatever do it for you. If you want to do it with them, that's great. First time my daughter wrote a check, she FaceTimed me and we wrote out the check together, right? But um, really make sure that you're activating your EMU card yourself, that you're logging into your account yourself, that you're doing all of those things yourself. Um, because again, this is your education, this is your bill, um, this is your future, and so it's really important to start, you know, adulting, as we call it, right now. Um, log into your e-bill, you can do this now, set up those authorized users, um, and look at that beautiful zero. And then this is the last bullet point, because it's really, really important that you have your final high school transcripts submitted to Eastern, so this would be your transcript that shows your graduation date. Um, so it, even though your, your, your ceremony could get delayed, right? Like you might not be walking across the stage on June 1st or whenever you thought you were gonna do that. But if that's when you graduated and everything is done and you've earned your, your high school um, diploma, that's when you need to get parchment or your high school guidance counseling office to send Eastern your transcript with that graduation date. Don't wait until maybe a delayed graduation ceremony to send that. Um, it's important that we have your official high school transcripts on file by um, the end of June, uh, if possible, because we can't pay any financial aid without those on file. So this is a final step in the admission process. 
but we actually talk about it in financial aid because we can't even pay a scholarship to you if you're not officially admitted and that you, this final high school transcript is what tells us that you're eligible to be in college because you have officially graduated from high school. So if you haven't already graduated, it's not something you can do now. There's no point in sending us what we would call a seventh semester transcript right now, um, but go ahead and do this as soon as you know that you have officially graduated. Um, and make sure that that gets in. All right, last thing I wanna talk about is service EMU. So normally when the university is open to in-person interaction, um, EMU Student Center is located, I'm sorry, service EMU is located in the EMU Student Center. This is a picture of the building. Um, Monday through Thursday, eight to five, and Friday, nine to five. You don't get assigned a financial aid advisor at Eastern. You don't have to talk to a specific person about your bill. Um, you know, you can go to them, walk up, no appointment needed, and get help with your financial aid, your bill, and even records and registration questions, um, all in the same place at the same time with the same advisor. Um, so you can just walk up and talk to those folks at EMU Student Center um, once we reopen for in-person interaction. Um, in the meantime, we are still answering our emails. Like I said, we're all still working from home and we are still actually answering our phone calls. So if you need to call, if you need to email um, and get something taken care of now, really, really encourage you to do that. Um, you can fax paperwork in, you can email it as an attachment, whatever works, um, and, and please do that. And then you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook. This might be more for the parents um, that are on Facebook, but it's a nice way to kind of keep a pulse on like what's going on. We will post things there um, that you'll be able to see, you know, like, oh, the FAFSA is coming out or registration is about to start or don't forget bills are due or summer, um, if you want to apply for summer aid, now's the time. Um, there's a scholarship application coming out, um, that kind of stuff. Um, I know a lot of students might not be on Facebook, but you know, we're, we're not quite on Instagram or Snapchat yet. So you'll just have to follow us there or your parents can and they can tell you kind of, um, what's going on. So normally, um, I don't even have time for questions. So this is, you're not really missing anything here. Um, I would just say, again, we are answering phones, we are answering emails. So if you have questions, please feel free to get those into us. Um, you're sort of lucky you're going to be able to listen and go back and forth on this presentation if I went too fast or I missed something or you missed something. Um, and go back to it. Um, but if you have any questions at all, please email us. Please reach out to us on the phone. Um, we are happy um, to help and we're, we want to be able to help you as you embark upon this journey. So thank you so much for listening to me. And I just want to really, um, even though I can't do it in person, um, welcome you to Eastern Michigan University. <laughs>